China's bad. The Chinese government is bad. Chinese culture is bad. Their culinary practices are bad. Their tech is bad. Their handling of COVID was bad. Their relationships with countries like Pakistan, Iran, and all of the African nations are bad. China is bad for American jobs. China is bad for manufacturing. China is bad for human rights. China is bad for starting viral pandemics. China is bad for global peace. China is bad for democracy. China is bad for freedom. China is bad. That sums up how we here in the United States see China. We see China near exclusively through our assumptions, which are rooted in our values and our vision of what is good. And what's good for the world is us, right? Because for something to be presented as bad, then there must be something opposing it, which is good. So what's good? It's us. We may not actually use the word "bad" in our headlines, in our entertainment, but the insinuation is constant. China, for us, is this alien, rigid, suspect, and dangerous foreign land that threatens our influence in the world. And threatening our influence in the world threatens us. This imagining of China as a threat, as uncivilized, has been more than 100 years in the making. But what would a reimagining of China look like? What would that look like in our newsrooms and our media? Is that even possible? Welcome to Backspace, where we tell you how the story is told in our headlines, and then we think about how we can tell it differently. For the last decade, China's been the big, bad, scary, red communist specter on the horizon of America's influence in the world. A lot of American jobs, millions,、mm-hmm. have been outsourced to communist China. The president has held China accountable for covering up the China virus and allowing it to spread death and economic destruction in America and around the world. Beijing's actions continue to undermine the rules-based order. China increasingly is a near peer competitor, challenging the United States in multiple arenas, while pushing to revise global norms in ways that favor the authoritarian Chinese system. But that's not really anything new. The media narratives around China are expressed differently today than they were a century ago in how they're expressed. But they have the same core elements. They still construct China and thus the Chinese as inherently uncivilized, and thus a threat. I feel like a lot of times when it comes to China and Western reporting, it's、uh, it's very information light but emotion heavy. It's entirely comprised of conclusions, and I think that goes against sort of、uh, journalistic professionalism because you're supposed to show, not tell. When I'm talking about how the Chinese are envisioned as uncivilized, what I mean is the unquestioned and exclusive framing. Of nearly 1.5 billion people as not only repressed but as unable to exist outside that repression. It's the idea that everything the Chinese government does and everything that happens in China is within the context of authoritarianism, with the government's means and often ends being repression. Take for example how coverage of China's handling of the COVID-19 outbreak in early 2020 was consistently referred to as draconian. A response that included the very same lockdowns that became a major strategy in many parts of the world for fighting the virus's spread. We need to go back to the early coverage of COVID.、Uh, part of it is that our journalists in China tend to be political journalists, and we covered it as a political story. We were really focused on regime type, for example, as as a, a distinguishing factor, and I think that it, it led a lot of people to conclude that. Because this is all about China as an authoritarian country, the United States, as anything but authoritarian, would be, you know, immune to to this 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 virus. Or how Chinese tech, which once was thought of as impossible to innovate given the repressive climate, is now discussed primarily in U.S. coverage within the scope of surveillance or questionable privacy practices. Not that the American tech industry knows anything about that. The way repression is presented in the context of China stories, it's made into an inseparable part of China and the experience of being Chinese, which hinges again on a complete lack of civilization, which we define by the United States' values. The one-party system is seen as archaic, anti-democratic, and thus anti-liberal. 
The official state ideology of communism is anti-human nature, and it's anti-Christian, which not only matters to a lot of people in this country, but it matters in a greater context because Christianity is foundational for Euro-American civilization. We talk about China as needing to join the international community or working with the international community. The assertion there is China. In a sense, just isn't quite as civilized as the rest of us. It hasn't achieved the same standards of civilization as the hallowed members of the of the international community. When coverage of China isn't about how repressive it is to its citizens, then it's about how China is constantly working to undermine American influence in the world. And it's this trope of China and the Chinese as a looming threat to all things American that is the primary driver of coverage of China in this country. And it's a trope almost as old as Chinese immigration to the United States. The first Chinese immigrants came here in the 1850s and quickly became a source of cheap labor. They built the transcontinental railroad. They became domestic help, laundry workers, farm workers. Any kind of cheap labor that was needed, you'd find Chinese immigrants at the helm of it in the late 19th century. And it got to a point where it was decided that there were too many Chinese immigrants in the United States. The proportion of Chinese immigrants in the United States was tiny compared to the overall population. So it was something like 0.02 percent. But it was decided that this problem was so big that imminent action had to be taken, and that's why the, the ban came in. The 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act was one of the earliest pieces of anti-immigration legislation in the United States. The idea that was popularized early on through that ban was that the Chinese pose a great cultural and economic threat due to the sheer size of their population. A very long-running visual image of the China threat,、uh, something that's been sort of reproduced and recycled over time, is this idea that there are sort of limitless Chinese people who can threaten the United States. That we still this had this idea that there are Overwhelming numbers of, of Chinese people that one day will just consume somehow the United States. Today, the more sort of subtle way that this is is produced throughout the Western media, you get these images of、uh, you know there'll be a story about the Chinese economy, for example, about how it's growing, but it'll be accompanied by a picture of the Chinese military, and it'll be a photograph of lines of, of Chinese soldiers all sort of holding their guns in an identical way. Sort of on a on a parade or a march or something like that, and that construction of limitless Chinese people evolves into limitless Chinese economic reach and power, which the heads of this country openly speak out against. I will not stand by when our competitors don't play by the rules. Look, we've been losing over many years, four, five, six hundred billion dollars a year. China has an overall goal. And I don't criticize them for the goal. We've brought trade cases against China at nearly twice the rate as the last administration. They have an overall goal to become the leading country in the world, the wealthiest country in the world, and the most powerful country in the world. We're losing a few years ago 200 routinely to China. We can't do that. That's not going to happen on my watch, because the United States is going to continue to grow and expand. If the playing field is level, I promise you, America will always win. Now here's something interesting. For a good part of the late 19th and early 20th century, it was the Chinese people who were seen as economic threats, as backwards, and as uncivilized. China itself, according to American opinion and policy, wasn't. The threat of China only came about after 1949, after Mao Zedong's Chinese Communist Party took power following a long civil war. It led an already anti-communist United States in the midst of the Cold War to become obsessed with China's new identity and system, which put it in the Soviet Union's camp. It's an obsession which was aggressively mixed with the preceding characterizations of the Chinese. Coverage today still relies on declarations of a communist China or red China or rising China, using the same images, colors, and framing that position China in diametric opposition to American values and civilization. Red China, communist China, totally normal. Like when we say corporatist democracy only for some United States, right? And these depictions of China rely at their root on the premise of endless invading Chinese images, which have been ingrained into the American imagination after more than a century of threat construction. These images were reinforced by the fact that U.S. and Chinese forces engaged in a hot war in Korea starting in 1950. When China came to the aid of its socialist allies, who were fighting a U.S.-backed regime in the South, 
at least a quarter million Chinese troops intervened initially and prevented the United States from overrunning what became the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. And so whether we're talking about Chinese immigrants in the late 1800s or Cold War China in the 50s and 60s, there is a thread of continuity underpinning the narrative of what kind of a threat the Chinese and China posed to the United States. Now, there was a moment of ideological reprieve when, in the 1970s, China was perceived to be opening up to so-called Western and capitalist values. And weirdly enough, that reprieve, if we want to call it that, was rooted in moves by the Richard Nixon administration. Nixon wasn't a fan of the People's Republic of China. Time and time again, he referred to the country as having uncivilized behavior and as the greatest Asian threat to the United States. But he believed that the goal should be to change what the status quo had been for so long. In 1971, seeing an opportunity for the U.S. to isolate the USSR following the Sino-Soviet split, Nixon's national security advisor, Henry Kissinger, traveled to China for secret talks. Shortly after, Nixon became the first American president to visit the People's Republic. He came back exalting the Chinese leadership and the prospect for peaceful relations. During this period, while China was still being painted as a threat in U.S. media, there was a romanticization of Chinese culture and lifestyle and what prospects a rapprochement between the two countries could bring. But this quiet excitement burst in the 80s. After Mao's death in 1976, another revolutionary from within the Communist Party rose to take his place, Deng Xiaoping. Despite being an avowed communist and a revolutionary alongside Mao, he saw that for China to survive, for the quality of life of everyday Chinese to improve, there had to be a move away from Mao's cultural revolution and his international vision. And so Deng opened China up to be a part of the world's capitalist economic system, introducing a series of economic, military, agricultural, and political reforms. The liberalization of its economy in particular caught the interest of the United States. In the future, the 800 million people who live, and that's one-fourth of all the people in the world who live there, will not live in isolation from the rest of the world. No matter what our relationship is with them on a bilateral basis, we want China to be a peaceful nation, to be secure, and to have their beneficial effects felt around the world. We have begun to write a new chapter for peace and progress in our histories, with America and China going forward hand in hand. Xi Xiao Bing Jin. Americans came to see China in a very different way. Um, in the 1970s in particular, there were much more favorable views of China. This was coupled with a political effort to get closer to China because it was considered that uh, China was a kind of useful counterweight to the Soviet Union. So it would be useful to have China on board to try to uh, diminish the Soviet Union's power. Deng Xiaoping was on the cover of Time magazine as Person of the Year twice, once in 1979 and again in 1986. He was meeting Euro-American leaders. China suddenly became a player in the very international capitalist order it had once been seen as alien to, until Tiananmen Square. While the Tiananmen Square protests were about increased government transparency and less political corruption, they were covered in U.S. media in particular as pro-U.S. style democracy protests. Public opinion plummeted of China, and in fact it's never really recovered since 1989, with this change in, in perception and image of China from one that was reforming into a more Western-style democracy and capitalist system, with the realization that that wasn't happening, public opinion changed, the perceptions changed, and the policies changed with it. There were embargoes on China, um, there was a complete um, uh, cancellation of, of diplomatic meetings and all that kind of thing, and, and this was a legacy that, that sort of haunted China um, throughout the 1990s. But while that legacy was haunting China's public image throughout the 90s, the country was rapidly developing. The same policies Deng had put in place led to not only China lifting 800 million people out of poverty, but also to the country becoming a massive economic power. Cue those old tropes. In the last 10 years, the American foreign policy position has been to illustrate China as the greatest threat to American economic and ideological hegemony in the world, and coverage of China has followed suit. China's draconian one-child policy. Women have been forced 
to abort their precious babies, gender side. Any agenda that we have with the government of China would also include human rights. CIA has a very important role in monitoring China's rise as a global power. That's how the story of China has been told, as a perpetual threat always at our doorstep. But if we could, how would we re-envision China? How can the story of China, in American news media especially, be retold?、Hmm? So there's a problem in how I even frame this question, right? This question of how do we retell the story of China? Because the underlying unquestioned assumption present is that China is a monolith, that there's one story to tell. Also, who is the we telling that story? Despite what we're led to believe about one-party states, no country or society exists as unchanging as uni-experiential, especially not one that has a population of almost 1.5 billion people. What our coverage, in effect, does is pathologize China, saying that it is uniquely different, that there's no way to relate to the Chinese people's culture, politics, and way of life. And when we buy into the pathologizing of China, we also buy into the idea that there is a lack of civilization there—a civilization that others in the world have agreed to aspire to. We feel like China has betrayed us by not living up to our expectations, and so we're seeing now in this whole、uh, sort of discourse on the so-called failure of engagement. Like we believe that you know, out of the goodness of our hearts, we extended this hand to China. Believing that they would become just like us, and when they didn't, you know, we feel insulted, we feel aggrieved,、uh, and I think that that that's really kind of on us. That's that's our, our、uh, psychological problem, and and、uh, it's built on a completely unrealistic expectation. And that because it is so different, because China is an affront to our values and mores, to. Our benchmark for the civilization that we have created and believe in, because we see China as in opposition to all of that, China's existence as it is is a threat, and that in turn impacts support for policies by the United States government that seek to thwart and criminalize China's economic and political influence in the U.S.'s global backyard. We situate issues in China against what we experience here, instead of seeing them as part of a connected story—a story that is very connected to us through history, through foreign policy, through the economy, through labor. We should see issues in China as real issues rather than、um, sort of a dystopian tale that needs. To serve as a cautionary tale for the rest of the world. Take, for example, stories about China's toxic work culture, which, according to American reporting, humiliates underperforming Chinese workers and is costing people their lives. The most infamous of these stories were about the 2010 Foxconn suicides, where at least 14 Chinese workers making Apple products took their own lives due to low pay and work conditions. While the poor working conditions and hypercapitalist hustle culture work ethic were critiqued, there wasn't, unsurprisingly, a very obvious link made between the struggle of workers in China and the struggle of workers here in the United States. In fact, look at this excerpt from a January 2021 Forbes article on Chinese workers' suicides. It makes a work culture link with the United States, but then quickly pivots, saying that apparently, unlike in the U.S., Chinese employers humiliate their workers. Yes, nothing humiliating about being forced to pee in bottles while working for one of the world's richest men. Instead of drawing links between borderless worker struggles driven by corporate need for profit at any human cost, the stories about Chinese workers become about Chinese culture. These stories lean into the deeply ingrained belief that the Chinese almost uniquely do not experience anything outside of repression that is both political and cultural. And this type of reporting on Chinese workers, which is very common, erases another important story: the direct complicity of our own companies and our economy in exploitative labor practices abroad, and the condition of this country's working class. There are a lot of good reporting on China as well, and these are reporting that focuses on real problems in China. For example, ex- expanding inequality in society, a lack. Or a very weak social safety net,、um, the poor treatment of gig workers,、um, and these are all very real problems. And
I would imagine other people from other parts of the world can relate to this these issues and find solidarity. Um, but bad reporting are the kind of reporting that insists that China's problems are unique, which only serves to other the Chinese people and prevent um, workers who are suffering from the same problems to find the grounds for solidarity. We run into the same problems with China and climate stories, stories which can often situate China as at the head of the human-caused climate crisis. For the past 15 years, China has been one of the biggest emitters of carbon emissions, even though historically the U.S. has released the most carbon emissions. And by that, I mean the U.S. leads by almost 200 billion metric tons. And so coverage of the human-caused climate crisis makes China the main culprit, despite the fact that heightened Chinese CO2 emissions became an issue well after CO2 emissions were already having a devastating impact on the environment. And those emissions, by the way, are in service of the American product and American consumer. Instead of getting an honest look at the holistic problem of the industry-driven climate emergency, China is blamed. And who does the specter of Red China's multi-front threat benefit exactly? None of this is to say that the Chinese government and its economic and political practices are just purely victims of a particular international order. But it is to say that our reporting here in the United States is framed quite a bit by Washington, D.C. and deeply embedded beliefs that rely on a story we've told about China for over a century. When we're talking about a rising China, it doesn't really explain very much. It doesn't really define what a rising power is. But what it does do is bring along certain connotations of a problem or a challenge, that China is disrupting things somehow, or that any country which is rising, quote unquote, is causing problems. And we tend not to use that language with other countries or other places. So when we talk about African economies, for example, which are growing very quickly, we tend to talk about them as modernizing or as developing. China is developing in ways which most benefit Chinese society. That was true of the United States, it was true of Europe. And so the way that China is going, that the decisions that are made in China are primarily being made for the interests of China, which shouldn't be a controversial statement. I'm not really too optimistic about the possibility of actually seeing coverage of China improve, as it were. I, I think that the, the only ways that I see uh, that really happening uh, would be flooding the field, just having just a whole lot more journalists out there covering it, be, because not everyone can write the same story. They'd have to be creative and go out there and travel the country and find other interesting stories to write. That's just not going to happen. There are ways in which we can talk about China that don't rely on age-old tropes that align themselves with American political and ideological interests. We can start with the language we use and rethink the ways in which we pathologize stories of labor, climate, surveillance, and even human rights abuses. By not doing so, we uphold an agenda that requires the dehumanization of an entire people. And when we do that, what does the work of journalists become? Hey guys, thanks so much for watching the video. This is what we've been working on for the last few months. We wanted to create a space, literally and figuratively, that we could use to critically engage with the big major media stories that pop up in our headlines time and time again. So this week we looked at China and we've got more episodes that really go into depth coming out soon, such as on cancel culture, everyone's favorite, and population control my personal favorite. So if you want to watch, make sure you subscribe, like this video, and we're going to see you soon, right? Yeah, I know. I know we are.